on BTF, the power of Zen plus Samurai equals hashtag free Laura? Question mark? The proficiency <laughs> of a fully powered punk problem. And the return of the Ice Queen because Nephew simply could not let it go. Welcome back to Beyond the Fist, the Street Fighter League livecast talk show presented by Toga TV. I'm your host, Tagashi Azrael, and this is episode 5, week 5, match day 4. The panel is back to full force with tonight's livecast first, Vancouver Street Battles. Claw Specialist with a flair for the flamboyant. New space. Same claw licking face. Say hello to Geki. What's up, my man? How much? How are you? Good to have you back. Next, bow in the presence of royalty. King Toxicity himself. Canada and Vancouver Street Battles Grandmaster Fong player. Say hi to Mortzi. What's up, man? Sounds like no one else got your frozen joke, but I appreciated it. <laughs> I like I like that. I like it. <laughs> and finally, you have no excuse, soldier! He's got a less functioning hand than you, and he's still beating you. Hashtag too easy. Say hi to Spliced Helix. What's going on, my man? I don't know that it's too easy, but it happens. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was good. That was good. All right. All video footage from today's live cast is used with permission from Capcom. Follow the Street Fighter League and the Capcom Pro Tour on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Capcom Fighters. On YouTube at youtube.com slash Capcom Fighters. And on Facebook Live. Facebook.com slash Capcom Fighters. All right, let's check those button inputs, boys. Time for your first hit. This is match one. Team Storm at one and two, taking on Team Gale at two and one. Here is your first clip. But here we are, Samurai versus Knuckle Do. Do you want to know a secret, Round Chat one. and Steve? Do you want to know a secret? Sorry. I definitely know that Samurai was practicing against uh, oh. G. Oh. Practice room. Oh. Like after after last week's show, after, like, I, I really need to study this match. Did you see that whiff? He did four fierce punch. He whiff punched it with a Kuma stand medium kick. It was crazy. Not as crazy as it seems. Not as crazy you know, as it seems. That stand medium kick is good, but it just looks cool. It's mad good. Yeah. It looks super cool. Don't get me wrong, but teleport. Man, that's a cheating button. Ooh, that was really good. Never thought to use the teleport to get out of those situations, but now you can see Samurai with the... Oh, okay. Tried to level up in front of uh, Samurai. Not going to be... Dash up, tried to get a throw. V reversal. He's the... I like that V reversal. Oh, beats out the V skill powered up by the trick. No. The wheel kick? Okay. This is dangerous. This is the hard part. He got caught low. He still has V trigger left. He might have... Oh, he might Yo. have been able to do it if he extended the combo. Mikey with the EX Dragon Punches. All right, guys, there we saw a little glimpse of Knuckle Dew and his character decision. He went with the G. Knuckle Dew's made an interesting character choice, even though his main guile, his secondary cami, and others were on the table. Defend or critique the captain's character choice, and what would you have done differently in his shoes? Welcome back, Geki. Here's your first take. Trash. <laughs> <laughs> he should never use G when he has characters like Guile, Mika, and Kami that literally cover every matchup in the game. Especially when Guile does so well against Akuma, especially that Kami does well against Akuma, especially, I'd argue, Mika does really well against Akuma. Maybe not the way... Knuckle Dude plays Mika, but his other characters definitely would handle Samurai a lot better. Um, especially with Samurai's patience and pressure, he's not going to get gimmicked out by G, and especially one as new as Knuckle Dude's. So I totally think he should have went someone else. Maybe Kami just for a more solid play, but I think the way he plays Guile is honestly the perfect way to go against uh, Samurai's Akuma. All right, Splice Helix, you are a Guile main. This must have shocked you a little bit, especially when uh, Team Gale was up 2-0 in this set. Going into this point, why not put the hammer down with the main character? What is going through your mind when you're seeing him pick G? I don't get it. I don't I don't get it. it I, I have little problems with Akumas that aren't like 35,000 points ahead of me. But why? 
just, just you got guile. You're probably the best guile in North America. What are you doing? What? Where? You got the right. The first letter is good. It, the G is fine, <laughs> but you need the while after. <laughs> Do you mean second best to you, Helix? Yeah, of course. No, no, no. I'm I'm not toy. I'm... <laughs> All right, Morty, your take on the character selection and what you would have done differently. Uh, it's hard to say. It's really what Knuckledo feels comfortable in that matchup. I, G is still a newer character in his repertoire as far as I'm aware. And so for him to choose the G over... Um, over either Guile, Kami, or Mika, there must be something that he was thinking about where it would make sense, but I don't necessarily see it when he has such strong characters that he could pick from. I don't know if I would have gone for Kami or Guile. Probably not Mika, to be honest. Just, yeah. But it still seems strange to me. Definitely not the G, though. The G just didn't seem to work, especially um, he missed, we saw he missed the uh, EX low confirm, or the EX, even the EX rush confirm off of, um, he got hit, jab, jab. So he has the time for the confirm, and then misses it, and then choose to go EX low anyways to get, to activate in the V trigger. So he had the opportunity, and it just, so it's things that kept happening like that that just reflected that his character choice wasn't he wasn't bringing the what he could the best of what he could to the table Gek, you got a point to, to add yeah um the only way i could see it as a benefit in do's eyes for picking g and no one else is that out of the characters he plays aside from maybe mika but the problem with mika is that she has no ways of dealing with zoning or air fireball so picking g while still keeping the mika mentality like that he can melt Akuma's life bar in like one or two mix-ups so maybe that was his option and he didn't want to use Mika because like, like I mentioned earlier the lack of fire, anti-fireball game um, with, you know, with G's V-Skill and G can get in a lot easier than Mika can and Guile and Kami don't really open up characters like Akuma and especially Samurai because Samurai is pretty patient and defensive on defense so you need to really condition him well to open him up so he probably felt that G would be a better option for doing so but it wasn't successful because like alex meant or morty mentioned it's too um unpolished and he's missing a lot of easy confirms that he would have gotten damage with any of the other characters he plays so it's a wasted effort in my opinion splice helix put yourself in do shoes for a second is there any particular reason that you want to continue to hide the guile now that you're four weeks into the competition honestly no i mean they're uh, they haven't targeted him for ban what what why are you not using him? I, I don't get it. You know, you you bring him out and and you absolutely dominate. Then you absolutely dominate. Then you then you worry about it. But up until that point, I don't see why not. Do you just a quick follow up, uh, Spices? Do you like the matchup between Akuma and Guy? Absolutely do. Absolutely do. You the air fireballs. You you've got you know if you've got your charge, the air fireballs don't mean anything. You know, you win on the ground uh, in, the, in the fireball game, and he's got good enough buttons to keep Akuma at bay for the most part. I don't, I don't understand not going with Guile. Last word, Bortzi. Uh, sounds about right. <laughs> Honestly, it's just we saw he misconfirms. He didn't seem there were actually twice, even in just in that clip, just in that that was just one round, wasn't it? Yeah. Like he did. Uh, the charge twice on block. Like, that just seems like you're... It's incredible, like Geki said, it's unpolished. And he's doing things, he's flowcharting through things without actually confirming anything. Even then, like, you wouldn't do those things on block. And I think you'd take a, a worse punish <laughs> by not even going into the, the charge. Like, it just seems silly. He's fishing without bait. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll end that part of the discussion there. Knuckle do uh, seemingly the beginning of the end for the downfall of team Gale in week uh, five. 
Uh, we'll get more into that later, but right now, let's talk about what actually happened with the rest of the set after Knuckledew fell. Here is Samurai. Let's take a look back at this last He's game. He's so smart. He's two Rob steps TV. ahead. Look at this, man. Checking all the way through. Samurai just playing. Watch this back up. Look at the range he's playing perfectly for, for a reason. Gets the sweep still and just wake up DP just for no reason. <laughs> this dude is crazy. <laughs> you need to ask him about those I think DPs. that might have been a punish on the low forward, honestly. That DP, because it was pretty close up, was so sick. The range that Samurai has played this entire team battle has been so smart. Finally gets the stun, and this is when it was getting dark. It was one more instance and then an empty jump right this after. This is the best part. You think you're going to block a normal? No, sir. The throw coming out, classical popping off his heart. All right, as you guys just saw there, that was the end of the Rob TV set against Samurai. Samurai in the last two weeks, 12 and 0. 12 and 0. Talked about Knuckledew's questionable decision, but Rob TV, of course, rocking his secondary as well as Shine. The post match interview also made a very interesting point, and Tasty Steve talked about it a lot. The strategy fulfilled. With the league's format presenting a possible counter strategy, does the cost of banning Akuma outweigh the benefit? Let's dive deeper, starting with Morty. Hell no. <laughs> What's really funny, it's like, uh, it's kind of like releasing, I guess you cage one beast and then you release another. So it's like you're taking King Kong out of the cage to fight Godzilla, but. In the end of the day, you still have to deal with one of them. That is a thick analogy. Um, I love that analogy. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> what's we're gonna see uh, one of two things. We're gonna see someone, one of the teams. Like everyone, there are so many teams. There are so many people, so many different thought processes that someone is gonna go. Let's try banning the Akuma, like, and see what Idom Laura can do, and then. Adam's gonna either OCV or lose game, his first game. Like, that's my. The it's either gonna go one of two ways. There's no in between. He's not. He's but chances are he's going to annihilate whoever he plays. Especially if he ends up with a, a good matchup off the bat and gets a little bit of momentum rolling for the rest of uh, the rest of the sweep. But I still don't think you ban the you ban the Akuma because XSK Samurai plays a Shoto that he can probably just swap over to another Shoto very easily. Um, whereas, we've all seen the birdie, and I don't think it's very scary. It's more likely that you're going to take down the Samurai Akuma than, have, than take down Idom Laura, plus whatever I, uh, Samurai decides to pull out. So I think uh, that's an Ixnay on the free Laura. So Geki, during the draft day... Uh... Well, I guess it was week one. During draft day, we did see uh, Samurai play a Karen relatively effectively. And uh, in the past, prior to season two, of course, he played Ryu. Uh, do you think that uh, banning the Akuma is potentially the right play here? If you're, Especially because the next matchup is actually Team Inferno versus Team Storm, which makes it very, very interesting. If you are Inferno, do you even consider letting Laura come to the jungle? So here's my two cents on that. So Akuma is a top tier character. He's been ever since he was released. Laura has been constantly nerfed, slightly buffed in season two. You know, she's pretty, pretty damn strong, right? In one season. Since then, she's been nerfed. Idom is an amazing player. Don't get me wrong. But clearly, by seeing his birdie, he's not a great fighting game player. He's a really good Laura, right? He won so, Dragon Ball Z at NLBC on, like two weeks ago. Fighter. We're talking to Street Fighter, okay? So, with Samurai, since he's good at playing Shodos, I feel he wouldn't perform as well if he picked Sagat, which is the character I assume he would pick um, because he's comfortable in the Shoto playstyle. But the problem with that is that the way Samurai likes to play, and he told me this in person at EVO, is that he likes catching people low with a confirmable low forward and chasing people walking back with his own walk forward, low forward, confirm. The thing is, Sagat cannot do that very well because his walk speed is incredibly slow. 
against most of the cast. Too slow, in fact, to do the same plan that Akuma can. Now, Laura is scary, and Idom is scary with her, 100%. Definitely a threat, as Morty was saying before, you know, Cage, King Kong, let Godzilla out, right? You gotta pick a beast, right? But, at this point, Samurai is undefeated. How bad do you not know the Laura matchup that you're just afraid of Idom entirely versus a practiced, patient, super strong Kuma player that has been destroying everyone he faces in this season? Like, come on. It's a no-brainer for me. Fan of Kuma. All right, so we got one vote for hashtag free Laura. One vote for keep her cage spliced helix. Split the tie and talk to me about this issue. I'm going to have to go with Geki. I... <laughs> it's punk, for one. So, dude has the attitude to be like, you know, bring on your Laura. Let me see it. And just the samurai being undefeated, it's it's a problem. There, you know, if you ban him and uh, and uh, they ban Karen, so Punk can't play Karen, then Samurai can't play her either. So then, who do you go to? You know, you're talking about you know he has good he has good uh, Shoto play, but we've seen over and over people that are good with Akuma, you know, aren't necessarily good with Ken, aren't necessarily good with Ryu, and don't even get me started with Kage. That's <laughs> That's something that you probably won't ever see in Street Fighter League. Um, but I absolutely agree, you know. Take out the Akuma. See how he does with his Laura. And it would be fantastically funny if he got he got exactly what he wanted. He got his character. You know, I'm going to whoop everybody and then just get going to. So very, very interesting. You guys saw Morty's facial reaction. Mine as well. I am going to make this a dead even heat. I do not believe you let idom have that main character you take the win and you take your chances with samurai who was only undefeated in the last two weeks in the first week he did not do so well so there is a possibility i will take the possibility of beating the 2017 pax west amateur series champion over someone as seasoned as idom four weeks in we haven't seen rob tv or knuckle do play guile see if that changes now that we're hitting the midway point next week or thursday excuse me so that's it for first hit let's go into the 50 50s with match number two team psycho versus team inferno and we are gonna have fun with this one boys check out so, the first clip sorry do we know then all the matches for next week uh going back to that we should because it's the only other match yeah it's the only match that hasn't been played yeah. among among all of them so far so we will okay. get into that first clip coming up right now And that's mostly because Toy was holding back the majority of that round. It's hard to move forward, honestly. Nash sometimes can be a defensive wall. Finds a way to break the defense with the Dolphin Dive. Jumping away, changing his arc with the medium punch instead. The Lazy Boy Recliner. Ugh. Oh, this is a good bunch of damage there to stun. Oh, uh oh we might, we might have a Fort Knox bar. A gold bar. Wake up. Oh. Ooh. I, yeah, wow, okay, not you. as much damage as I, I told thought. You. Okay. I you thought I was playing? No. <laughs> Crouch jab to take it and toy instantly takes oh. out the headset. Hits him with the let's go. And just the oh. kid is up and he one, is going to more. be playing punk. Big one more. Well, one more. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Toy and JB were the targets for the bands in this matchup. Toy, as per usual, went with best birdie NA. And surprisingly, JB went with the counter pick of my boy Nash. Which on paper is good, but JB doesn't play Nash. Did JB, or here's your 50-50. Did JB make the right call this time around, or should he have stuck it out with Birdie? Time to make the read. Let's start with Splice Helix. I hear that's a good counter pick. I, I used to play Nash. Until he got hit with a dump truck. Um, but <laughs> if it's... Uh... You know, if it's a good matchup and he feels he can do it, then why not? Even though it's the best birdie in A, you know, it was nice to see Nash. It was somebody last week said something about picking a Nash in that matchup. I can't remember who it was. Oh, it was my wonder. That's right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think if he had a little bit more practice with the character, that it would have been fine. But he didn't. 
and it's the best birdie NA. You're not going to win, man. Hmm. All right, Moitzi, talk about the matchup. All right, so as you said, it's apparently a good matchup for uh, for Nash. But there was... Uh, my God, you brought out Nash against apparently a favorable matchup. Obviously, the Rashida's banned, and I like that. Team's starting to ban away uh, JB's Rashid, which is awesome. Especially, I mean, obviously, it's not technically happening after, but JB has shown what he can do with that Rashid by winning Texas Showdown because he's dope. Um, and I he doesn't want to play the mirror match although I feel like he could probably still win the mirror match <laughs> um, and I guess he thought what characters do I have experience on and what characters give me an advantage in this matchup and I guess that was Nash if like he's just instead of doing who do I want to play here it's just like a process of elimination going down the list of like damn it who can I play here <laughs> So I like I don't mind it. Obviously, he's not going to be super polished, but it's like he's just trying to put it, give himself the best option. And I guess Nash was what he felt that he could do, because if he didn't have anything else, then like what else is he going to put forward, right? At least give himself a good matchup to work with. And it wasn't awful. Still not great. Obviously, he lost a toy, <laughs> but yeah, so it wasn't terrible. He did, in fact, lose to the best birdie in North America. Geki, close us off on this discussion. You play against Minash a lot, and you know sort of the character. How do you feel about the matchup, and do you think JB made the right decision? Well, I know for a fact that when I played JB at Red Bull Proving Grounds in Chicago about, I think that was in Season 2.5, technically, when birdie wasn't that dominant, and uh, Nash was pretty okay, would you say? Okay. No. Are you okay? No. Okay, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> but he was playing Nash in casuals against me and a handful of everyone else, including Toy, which I might add. Um, but the thing is, in this season, the matchup is definitely heavily in Birdie's favor or possibly just even. Even though Nash is still a good matchup overall, but at this level, with how much Birdie got buffed and how the other characters kind of came down... Nash really didn't get touched at all. His V trigger one is kind of broken in some aspects. Like it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, as Togo will probably tell you later privately in a DM. <laughs> but <laughs> let's not make this about me and continue. <laughs> of course, of course not. I'm not trying to. But I think his Nash is much more polished than other characters we've seen in this circuit. Like for example, Knuckle Doo's G. Um, so I don't think it was a, an, an unpolished choice to make. Um, and JB's comfortable with Nash, he's comfortable with the playstyle, he seemed to be almost right at home. Um, but Toy, Toy understands patience really well, and so he's not going to get killed by running into booms, he's not going to get killed by making risky decisions. Um, we'll, I mean, we'll see it later, I'm kind of, you know, foreshadowing here, but he really showed the awareness of playing birdie at a simple level, keeping it really simple and effective. So I think that's what gave him the edge in this matchup and in the matchups we'll see against Team Inferno later on in the show today. I so, want to hear. I want to hear from the host, the guy that mains Nash. I want to hear what you had to say about how he played, why he played, what he did, and what he. I will be honest. It wasn't terrible, but Geki can attest to this, and Morty can attest to this on some level. He sort of looked like Toga Nash Season 2 where he was holding that bar and not anti-airing and not doing a lot of things that <laughs> Nash should be doing. Uh, I don't think he took full advantage of certain tools that Nash has. Uh, Nash should have... He should have been playing Guerrilla Warfare. It's hit, back it up, and force Birdie to come to you. Uh, and he just didn't do that as effectively as I think he could have. And that's just a straight contrast to the playstyle that he is used to playing. So that that's sort of the the end of that one. He could have tried to play Nash a little more aggressively, um, and it probably would have cost him more than it would have uh, benefited him. And like you guys said, it does come down to being a very very practiced. I've been preaching since season two that Nash is one of the few characters in this game that you have to play absolutely perfectly to get wins, compared to other characters who have better tools. So. 
that's all I'm going to say about Nash and ranting about Nash, because that's not what this show is about. This show is about Street Fighter League. Here's hoping that we do get to see maybe a more polished Nash from JB if he figures it out, if he needs to, because it looks like Rashid is going to be the target moving forward, at least against Team Inferno for now. Moving on with this matchup. Actually, no, before I do that, because there was something that was really important in this particular matchup, and I'm going to ask each of you for a brief statement on this. Toy, after game one, stood up, walked up to JB, and shook his hand. We talked about to Toy's personality shining through in this tournament. What do you think about the, the midway point pop-off? Uh, answer in the same order. Splice Helix first. I love, I love the personality in this thing. It's just, it's so perfect. It adds that, it adds that flavor that you don't usually get in, you know, normal tournaments uh, on the weekends or CPT events. It's just the attitudes and the pop-offs and the, just the mind games are just, they're fantastic. Morty, thoughts on the game two rebuttal from JB? I... <sighs> What my it wasn't just the toy walking over and asking like okay what what could you have done there what uh, what do you think you could have done better than that uh, that was what he was saying to him is when JB got up after and walked over after the second game and did the same thing or was it yeah yeah that was, was, yeah that was the second game yeah it's just it's the banter between players and that's something actually was really I thought was really fun was because you don't really get to see that kind of shit talk coming from jb that dude's fairly stoic when it comes to like when he beat knuckle dude he kind of just like at like a texas showdown he kind of didn't pop off didn't all. react much no you, you just got in the grands dude or no that was against dual kevin didn't he that was when he won the freaking tournament yeah. yep what the hell yeah no that's even weirder <laughs> What the hell? He, 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 reacted, he was like, yes. He was like, yes. What? And he didn't. That's it. That's, he, he, won a, he won a high kick and he went, yeah. Oh, way to go. He's very man. reserved. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like, that's really fun to see. And I think, especially being among friends, because I believe him and to or, uh, Punk are like buds. So being among people that you're comfortable with helps a lot. But it's still, it's really fun to see. Geki closes out on this topic. Man, Toy is such a character. He to he totally embodies what Bison is all about, about talking trash, having a big grin on his face the whole time, a little bit psychotic, obsessed with power. Um, and to push JB's buttons like that, that takes a strong, strong personality. So props to him for doing that, because getting someone to crack in that way and break character or reputation that JB has was quite amazing to watch so good on good on him all right that was just the tip of the iceberg though that's the scary part we got more to talk about in the team inferno bag of tricks uh i wrote this in the script and i would i do want to say this out loud so that people can actually hear it the title of this clip is the punk problem appendix a psychological warfare take a look <laughs> the way Toy, his mouth was ajar, just looking at the opposite team, like, what is happening? Focus on your own team, man. Defense looking really good up until that point, just a kid. Oh. So Punk is now kind of sniping out when Justin Kid wants to walk back after the strings. After the stand short, when he goes for the crouch strong, if he sees Justin Kid standing up, he immediately goes for the low forward. You've seen that time and time again. That's the second instance so far. Pick up after the trigger activation. Gives him a lot left there, too. Nice view reversal out. Doesn't want to let Justin Kid get started with that beat trigger. Nice conversion. Critical are incoming. That's going to be it. Game one going to Punk. Huge adaptation made. Leading him to get that victory. Ain't no rollback offline. <laughs> Toy, teach no warlord. Tell him no warlord strategies in here. It's none of those. You got two warlords too, dang. You got you got, you got two warlords over there. That's crazy. The moment he took care of I did next. That was your man. Oh, you are. 
All right, gentlemen, you guys knew we were going to talk about this, so this is going to be a whole ton of fun. We brought up Punk and the Psychological Warfare for the first time in week two against Team Frost. Here's your 50-50 calling out the online warriors, the warlord strategy, and trash talking during the matches. We didn't get a chance to hear that in that previous clip, but during the matches... Against just a kid who he uh, he he called him just his son after the match was over, <laughs> and against El or against Chakotay, he was talking during the match. Is this fair or this is foul, Mortzi? What's up, man? This well, this is the great thing about having the, this kind of league where there isn't necessarily any real stakes. I mean. Do they get a prize for the winning team? Winning team gets yeah. Money, there's right? there's okay. money on the line. Oh, yeah. But it's still, especially when you're in, I guess you're still in this kind of environment where these, this team stuff is, warrant not warranted per se, but it's it's not even encouraged. It's just dudes bantering between each other and they just look like they're having a lot of fun. There's not. It seems like a low pressure environment, but damn, this is punk is. So he that dude is far witty than far more witty than you would he would let on. And it's really enjoyable to watch, especially that dynamic between Toy, who we've already talked about being a very uh he's got a very enthusiastic personality, and uh punk. But the best part is that punk has the skill to back up all of his shit talk. So it's really it's kinda hard to go back at him. Uh, I don't know if we plan on talking about the Punk versus uh, Toy match, do we? I don't think we do. Uh, no, we do not. This, this, is, this is it. But yeah, but I'm I... bringing it up now because. Okay, go ahead. So I, even during Toys and Punk set, where mind you, Toy took Punk to last game last round with Birdie. Obviously, it's a good matchup for Birdie, but it was still hilarious. He goes to stun him. All right, he's <laughs> Punk is one hit away from stun, and he's. Walking up and hitting crouch jab, and he just starts yelling at Punk, "Hit a button! Hit a button, Punk!" <laughs> and he eventually gets a stun, and he pops off, and then he forgets what combo he has to do, and he yells that after he kills him. He's like, "I forgot what combo I'm supposed to be doing." And this is the kind of stuff that we want to see in this kind of uh, this kind of show. Some stuff that's not even obviously we want good competition, but we want entertainment, and this is exactly the way to do that. Yeah, I, I really think Punk really knows how to market himself and, and push that his personality forward. Him and Toy, of course, do do that really, really well. Let's go over to Geki, who uh, I, I have old footage of you and Trash Talk before, but it's not associated with you normally. What do you think about the Trash Talk on the side of Punk? What footage do you have of me? Jesus Christ. Uh, that, that time that you called out Shane Walker. Oh, that one, right. Anyway, <laughs> and link. so so I'll tell you this. It's on my oh, phone. I have to show it to you guys later. All right, I'm down. So I think when you when you talk back to Punk after he trash talks you, he already has done what he set out to do, and that's affect you. And that's what when a bully <laughs> tries to bully you and you retaliate or react to it. That's what he wants, right? He wants validation. He wants to be acknowledged. He wants to know that I exist or what I'm doing is working. So the fact that they're calling out the warlord status, like the online strats, like getting Toy to yell, like, come on, push a button. I want to kill you. Like, it's just magic right there for you to see that this is what works against people. Except like, yelling we... about the stun thing did work. That's true. That's true. But I don't even think he was paying attention to that, to be honest. I Maybe. think he's just enjoying himself. Like, you know what? All right, I'll press something here. Let's see what happens, right? You know? Because Punk is the best player, hands down, in this entire series. And he knows it. And when he gets like this, it's incredibly hard. Because you have to fight two people now. You have to fight the, the personality of Punk, which is one level. And if you can break through that and get him to stop and be serious, like what Samurai has done and other players, then you, you fight your punk. So because these people mostly play offline or mostly play online, like Tay and Just a Kid, they're just not going to crack through that confident punk when other players can. So good job on punk. Like he knows what works and he's going to keep doing it. Also, this is post Frosty Fausting. 
So he kind of knows he's got Chakotay in his bitch pocket. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Spliced Helix. I mean, sorry, Nostradamus or is it Spliced Helix? Spliced Helix. We talked about how strong this, this psychological warfare game is previously, and you predicted Team Inferno to be in the driver's seat. And look at them now at 4-0 and o going up. They will be going up against Team Storm uh, coming up on Thursday. There are some stoic dudes on Team Storm between, um, uh, especially with Samurai kind of just sitting there. What does Punk have to do, or what does, what does Team Storm have to do to not only break through Punk, but to break through potentially Karen, who we saw Punk at full power this past week it was the punk problem full effect he set up residents in that team's head every single one of them for free he just lived there it was great it was he i think honestly i really do think that he let toy win that game that he took i think he was sandbagging ridiculously hard he was messing around just to add another layer of this is what I can do when I try. I, I don't think that the personality of the next team that he's facing is anywhere near as, as flamboyant as the last one, and um, I don't. I don't think they're gonna. They're gonna have any kind of weapons against that psychological warfare. Will you go as far to say then that Team Inferno will end at the midway point of this season five and zero? Hundred percent. Who do they have left to play? Team Storm is next. <laughs> That's the perfect reaction. <laughs> we did talk. We no. did touch on it briefly. That if Idom gets Laura, yeah, this is actually if Idom gets Laura, and I think Punk might be confident enough he to will. do that. Hundred. If someone's gonna do it, it's going to be Punk. We will have to see. And, and Team Storm is going to aim to match up against Idom first. I no one hundred percent. He is gonna try and snipe Yomi his way into whatever match, whatever order he can to face off first against Idom, so he can just rip the beast. He can quell the beast as soon as it's released. The great thing is gonna be if he if they don't ban Laura, and he gets matched up with Broly, first game, and Broly just wipes. Oh them. my god! Yeah. He well, I mean, th this is the first week. Oh. Because since we're still talking about this matchup, Chakotay absolutely destroyed Broly. We haven't seen Broly yes. look bad until right now. That might be the Mika Chun thing. That might be Chakotay versus Broly. That might be Chakotay versus Chun. We don't actually know. But it, it seems really interesting. Should... Okay, so let's let's say that Idom does get Laura. Let's presume then that Samurai's Akuma gets banned. On the mm -hmm. other side, if you are Team Storm, who do you target? Geki. That's a really hard choice. Um, what, what's Laura's most matchup? Among the roster. Because, I mean, she has a bunch of bad matchups. Akuma is way less. So, I mean, you definitely ban Akuma. And then on the other side, I think it's really up to them. Like, anyone they want, to be honest. Uh, you definitely ban Rashid. That's probably, like, the safest bet. Because, you know, as we've talked about before and as I've said before, there's no reason to ban one of Punk's characters. Unless your entire team has a bad matchup versus that character and you're really worried that he might feel himself and he'll know that and he'll pick that character, sure. But when you can nerf JB really hard, you might as well take it because you're not going to nerf Punk. Uh, last word, Splice Helix. I mean, he covered all the points. It's... It really comes down to what kind of strategy they want to employ. If they want to go after one of the specialists, or if they want to keep Punk away from his main, because he showed what he can do with Karen, with you know against the whole team. So at that point, it's what do you do? Where do you where do you aim your one bullet? Fair enough. So that second set. Okay, Morty, finish us off. Just want to finish it off, yeah, and say that every character gets mixed the same. <laughs> That is 100% true. So the panel and the hosts are split two to two with regards to the uh, the hashtag a free Laura, which was golden, by the way, at the end of that first set when uh, <laughs> they had the, the sign free Laura. 
prepped and ready to go. A huge props to Team Storm on that one. But let's move on. We've gone through two. We've got one more to go. This is the final round. We seem to be breezing through this a little bit. Um, this is Team Frost versus uh, Team Spirit. And the greatest part about these this past week, every single one of these sets went to five games. That is crazy to me. Nice. Here's the, here is a look at Team Frost versus Team Spirit. Understood the situation. Now it's going to be match point for Nephew. Did Abigail bite the tire when he when, when he lost on the tire? I didn't see it. Yeah, it like he bit the tire. The one on his arm. To be clear. Oh, that's what Nephew was looking for to kind of see uh, Brian F's counter pokes. Okay. Walking down that corner, gets another crush counter. Stun, starting to become a factor. Decent damage here. Not a throw yet, counter hit, there's the stun, and Nephew. Oh, try to get a reset and a bait as well. Fishing with that sand fierce, we talked about this before, when it comes to Colleen, that's one of her favorite buttons. Ooh, wow, just right out of range, that roundhouse whiffed. Oh, he oh. dropped the combo. He tried to go for the command grab too far out. Nephew is going to be taking out Brian F. And the ban pick towards Balrog is paid off. All right. So both team caps is interesting target interesting target bans for this matchup. Dual Kevin's Rashid and Brian F's Balrog were the targets. As you guys just saw in the last clip, of course, Brian F went down to Team Frost Captain. Nephew in the previous matchup saw Dual, G Dual Kevin's G fall to spirit captain justin wong's minot let's play hypotheticals in this final round scenario starting with mortsy which band character would have proven more difficult to deal with in their respective matchups and why i think rashid would have been more difficult to deal with uh because he specifically if we're talking in if the order stays the same regardless of the bands that means that it would have been brian f uh, Balrog versus Nephew, and then Dual Kevin Rashid versus Jaywong Minot, and that is not a good matchup for Minot. That is a matchup that, um, no, it just it sucks. That's the matchup that Infiltration or uh, you know that guy uh, play, <laughs> played uh, would play Jury for because it was that bad for um, for Minot, and it's only I think based on the changes that happened, it's actually only gotten worse due to the Eagle Spike change. Um, so, I think the Rashid would have been a lot worse. I am, I was laughing pretty hard at the, that, the EX command grab, because it just shows that the last time Brian F played Abigail was season 3.5. <laughs> <And, laughs> yeah, that's true. When that would reach, those are the habits that he still has. But it sucks, but it was also really funny. And also because he did down back heavy kick instead of doing normal sweep because he's holding block, right? And that's, and it's the new special move that, or special move, new, um, wow. Uh, command normal. Thank you. You're uh, new command <laughs> normal that Abigail got in season four for some reason. So yeah, I thought that was pretty funny, but unfortunate, it wasn't terrible. He took it to the last game. Like he still took a game against nephew. Uh, also thought it was really funny that nephew did parry into parry because <laughs> he knew it was coming. But yeah, I definitely think Dual Kevin's Rashid would have been a lot more difficult to deal with due to the matchup. Uh, not necessarily due to the skill, but due to the matchups that it would have lined up. All right, Splice Helix. Uh, expand on this just a little bit. With regards to Morty talking about the Rashid matchup just against um, just against Minot, but how would have Rashid done against the rest of the team going back the other way? Honestly, I think he's he's secure enough on on Rashid he's, he's comfortable enough with it that it would have made the matches a bit better in his favor um but honestly I think either one of them if you would let them have their characters would have done better than they did it's Brian <laughs> poor Brian if you could see that he's not he's not as as solid on on Abigail as he is comfortable with with how he plays Balrog All right, Geki, finish us off on this topic. Which character would have been more difficult uh, to deal with? Um, so I, I really do think the banning was done excellently in this set because, as 
Mortsy and Helix both mentioned, um, Rashid gives every character on spirit side a hard time, right? And the reason, and then because they know that, Team Frost knows that, so they're going to ban Balrog because JB and Brian F play a lot. And he, Brian F studies the hell out of that matchup. Not only that, he studies the hell out of Colleen, and he studies the hell out of Nikali, because Kami, being a close friend of his, they play that match night and day all the time. And he has the best matchup against this team so why not ban balrog so i totally agree with that i don't think you ban manat i don't think you ban any other character because most of the characters can deal with manat on their side nikali is a good matchup against manat rashid is a good matchup colleen does decently with the hailstorm uh, fireball to keep uh, manat in check from throwing out certain normals um and abigail obviously brian f is a studied abigail with tech and you know understanding the character but as morty said earlier this is a new season and there's some things that drastic drastically change how abigail is played and ruins a lot of setups in neutral that he missed like the command grab that he didn't get um so i think the bands were executed perfectly i don't think i would change anything um and in, in terms of the matchup order you can't really know for sure but i think they they made the safest bets based on character matchups which is one of the first times because usually when they people do bans uh they ban overall for the player's benefit but i think this was more targeted for their character matchups so i think that was really interesting to see quick follow-up for you guys morty who showed up better with these uh set quote-unquote secondary characters was it dual kevin's g or was it uh brian f's abigail wait you have nephew winning 2-0 or you or, said they all went to game three, right? No, did did I get that wrong? I, I think nephew did sweep the table as well. I think he went two zero. No, on but you have nephew winning two zero over Brian F. Oh, it was, was it was it two one? Okay. Yeah, I thought you said that they all went to oh game, game five game five series. Yeah. yeah, okay. I'm thinking like, all right. Uh, uh, it's hard to say. Like Brian F still did decently. Actually, I think was Brian F. Did J one take a round? Or are they, did they actually, did Nephew actually just 2 0 everyone? Nephew oh, did actually, now. yeah. I think uh, the dual Kevin, the G was good. It just, it's hard to say when you're just like, who? I think dual Kevin, all right, here, dual Kevin's uh, G was better than Knuckle Deuce. <laughs> I don't know where that puts it on the scale, but I think. He, that's still, like, he still did decently, and I also think that Brian F's Abigail, honestly, he might have been able to take it against one of the other two people. Maybe not up to snuff. Up to snuff. Oh, actually, up to snuff. By the way, I didn't know this, but Nikali is a garbage matchup for, um, for Abigail. Because uh, Nikali actually, and that's one that, uh, up to snuff has a massive amount of experience in. Uh, due to playing consistently against Blarlat yeah. every Wednesday night fights. Yep. So and Mad King too. Yeah, him. Yes. <laughs> but I think I mean when it's when I looked at the off season, every single time it was up stuff in Blarlat as like top two. So uh, I think Brian F probably would have gotten <laughs> destroyed <laughs> if he had had to play against up to snuff. Uh, but Dual Kevin's G might have been able to take games against other people. So it's kind of, it's interesting to say, I do think Brian did better against his opponent, but it's still, I don't know if, I think Brian, uh, Dual Kevin had a better chance of doing well if he had won nice first. All right, let's close off that topic right there, because we got, uh, instead of hypotheticals, the actual matchup to get to. So let's take a look at the second one. This is the first mirror match of the entire tournament. This is up to Snuff and Psycho. Take a look. Life lead there, a big swing turnaround. Mm. Dang, the crouch fierce. The man grab afterwards. Cycle in control right now. And I like how he's in range. He knows he's in range to get that low four just in case afterwards. That's a stun, a good amount of damage. I think one mix up away for Psycho. Okay. Uh oh. Nice blocks there. Great defense from Psycho. Get the view reversal. Get off me. 
but it's still it's, even though it grants him that space nikali gets to keep the v trigger but it doesn't matter what your name is ex uppercut like three four times all right so the commentators did bring it up the, that ex uppercut throughout the entirety of that match came to play in the first mirror match of the tournament it was psycho that ended up bringing out the monster taking down fellow nikali up to snuff and we talked about up to snuff's akuma in the previous weeks but we haven't really seen the success of the up to snuff nikali to this point should up to snuff have avoided the mirror match and taken a different approach spliced helix um if you're going into a mirror you know how you play you know and what you look for uh in your character and it's obviously his his most uh comfortable solid uh pick to play with to play against people so i don't i don't think at that point knowing what you know and, and feeling the way you feel about your character that you that you risk going to something else that you're not as as uh practiced in all right, short and to the point. That that makes 100% sense. Geki, were you shocked at all at the end result of this matchup, considering that Up to Stuff should know the character backwards and forwards? For sure. I just think the way Psycho plays is very good in the mirror match. Um, and he plays very hit-and-run, aggressive, and his patience is very good. Up to Stuff is not as offensive-oriented. Also, I love seeing the mirror match for Nikali. I don't know why. Just something about it is so barbaric. Statistic. Yeah, it's a di I don't know. Just I'm saying you're so sadistic. Oh, I am. Oh, uh, I mean, I play I play a psychopath myself, so no, no surprise there. Um, but yeah, I think Psycho has the more experience than Up to Snuff in terms of playing people that he doesn't know. Up to Snuff is really good against people he gets to play constantly, but against uh, international players or people he doesn't have a chance to kind of grind the matchup or grind the player matchup, I should say, with. Um, he tends to falter a little bit, where Psycho has done extremely well at Capcom events online constantly because he doesn't get to travel offline as much. But in online scenarios, he does really well, consistently plays at least top 16 based on uh, the last tournaments he's entered, I believe. Um, but yeah, super strong player. Not surprised he beat up to snuff. All right, so we, so Geki touched on uh, the path that Psycho has taken, obviously, to get to, get to this point in time. Morty... How do you does, did uh, up to snuff really just play into psycho here, or was there more to it than that? Uh, it didn't seem like up to snuff established any pressure to say, not to say like literal pressure where he was putting pressure on him on offense or something like that, more on the fact that it just seemed like psycho wasn't intimidated in any fashion whatsoever. He just went in, he felt like he it looked like he had control throughout pretty much the entire time they were playing. So it's... There was no reigning in of his opponent. He didn't... Like, even that round, he made the read. Uh, Psycho made the read on the jump and just waited and did the DP, the EXCP. I thought that was sick. That was just a fantastic response to the jump back. Um, and there was, wasn't really any point to taking any risk um, in, like, going for the command grab or trying to do anything so he just sat back um but i think that it was a 2-0 still took rounds it's hard to say i just up to stuff it didn't seem like he didn't look like he had control he got chances to take control and up to snuff very quickly or uh psycho very quickly uh snuffed him out nice that was, it there. I'm that, not that was good that. that that was good uh close us out on this one spliced helix um, was this Psycho's coming out party, and we're, are we going to see an even more dangerous Psycho Nikali moving forward? I th I think he's I think he's where he wants to be. I think he got his character. He showed that he's the best out of the two, and you know he'll be. I don't think I don't think he's going to be at the at the level where people will ban Nikali for him. But I think he's he's going to be. All right, let's close that one out there. We got one more topic to discuss before we close this one out. And I think this was probably the most important matchup in the entire set. We're going to go Captain versus Captain. This is Nephew versus Justin Wong. 
Oh, he had a nice little chunk on it. A there. little bit, yeah. Holding on to it. Chunk that's gonna right. put, yeah, that's gonna put match point there for nephew. Oh, crush kind of sweet. Nice exchange there. Bunch of trades. Yeah, it was a fierce to fierce exchange. Nice jump back jab to kind of check the vanity step. Let it rain. Yeah, he can't. He has to hold that. Great block on the overhead and the side switch. Now Justin Wong in full control. I take it all back. Oh, the side switch, Justin. Keep him there. You're not allowed to press a button during that exchange, and Nephew is going to take down the other team captain. Thank you. All right, there you saw it. That was Nephew taking a 2-0 over Justin Wong. Now, on paper, Colleen appears to be a solid Minot counterpick. Of course, I'm talking about the parries that help deal with sort of the footsie tools that Minot has. Two dangerous characters now on the side of Nephew. We saw the G pull off the OCV. Nephew had to win all of the games in this set as well. But Duel Kevin was the target ban. Moving forward, should there be an adjustment in strategy? Geki. I think, uh, like I mentioned before, I think this particular ban on the side of Spirit and Frost was meant for to benefit the player's characters, not the players themselves. So I think down the line, if there's no advantage for banning based on character matchups, I think you definitely ban something of uh, for nephew because he's clearly the strongest player on the team in most cases against certain against most of the players in this uh in the league but and the colleen is just incredibly strong in many many matchups at least g has obvious weaknesses that a lot of the other team's characters can abuse and you know destroy but the thing is, G is also a new character as well, so it's really hard to say which you ban, but you definitely should be banning one of Nephew's characters and not leaving him alone. Unless, like I said before, if there's a character that you can ban to kind of benefit your team overall. All right, Mortsy, are you surprised at uh, the 2-2 two and two record now for Team Frost? Oh, is it 2-2 two and two or is it 3-1? and one? They are... Oh, I didn't write it down. Are you surprised at their record? They, are you surprised at their record right now? And is contrary to week two, where Punk said that Up to Snuff was the most dangerous player on Team Frost, has Nephew emerged as the clear cut most dangerous player? Oh, that's the second OCV, right? Yeah, he OCV'd with G as well. Yes. Yeah, he OCV'd G. Um, one, I think, uh, Geki, I thought it was kind of funny that you said that G implied that G has weaknesses. Um, I'd like to also reiterate that uh, every character gets mixed the same. Um, <laughs> by G is, and I've, I've said this before, and I will hold this opinion. G is the se season 3.5, or the 3.0, was it 3.0? I think it's 3.0, Abigail, where he was just, it doesn't matter how good the matchup is for your character, everyone dies the same. Apparently not, but we'll get there. Um, so it's like, uh, I still I don't think you ban either of nephew's characters the unless you have like an awful awful matchup across all three of your characters um, for a single match the reason for that um, is because so the general idea is that if you ban one of nephew's characters and you think about nephew still has a secondary that is capable of doing an OCV that means you now have two at least two matches if we say you ban up to snuff to Kali or you ban um it was it's dual kevin yeah mm -hmm. uh you ban dual kevin rashid so you ban one of those characters right and now you have one person on the other other team who is much weaker and so you kind of have a free win kind of so you only have to go through nephew net the you have three people who just have to go through Nephew. Whereas, if you ban one of Nephew's characters, you still have to deal with Nephew. And then you also have to deal with Dual Kevin. And, of course, Up to Snap, or whoever you decide to not ban. Which means that instead of you have, instead of one person that you desperately need to beat, you now have two. 
which is the same uh, same idea behind not banning Punk's characters or not banning Justin's characters. Same thing. It's one you only have to deal with them once, and then it's over. So it doesn't matter what character they're playing. Otherwise, you're dealing with two very strong people and one who's playing a secondary where it doesn't matter. Geki, try and hold your thought for just a little bit longer. I do want Splice Helix's thoughts on this uh, topic. Splice Helix, go ahead. I've got I've got the same mentality as Morty. It's it's at the point where it doesn't matter who you ban from Nephew. He's got another character that can do almost exactly the same thing. So you go after somebody who has shown that when you take out their main, they don't have as much of a follow up as as Nephew does when you take out Colleen and. It's it's he's got an OCV with two different characters, so it doesn't matter who you ban because he's got somebody else to back up. Go Geki. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Geki. I just wanted to add, just to you know, further explain uh, Morty's point about G and how he sits in this season. So in season two, Balrog, Laura, and uh, Yurian were the characters that were most threatening. And most volatile. complained about volatile, right? They were met ruin. It. They were ruining Street Fighter Five, right? Everyone complained about them in some degree. So I think G is a culmination of all three of those characters into <laughs> one. All the problems those characters had are now in one character. I like that. Well, that that's actually a, a very interesting point because I brought up previously as well. Probably not on this, but uh, on Vancouver Street Battle or something. That uh, G is. Uh, Season 2 Balrog without the Season 3 nerf. Nerf back. Exactly. So, so you get Command Grab because Laura... With better, with better mix-ups. Better mix-ups. You get EX-straight, EX-low. You get Urian-level combos. You get get in no regards to neutral, right? Everything. Everything those characters had at their peak, G has now in a new season. Ban G. Ban G. More to go ahead. Okay, so this isn't necessarily to do with the uh, points that we've talked about, but it kind of made me think that if uh, we're thinking like, damn, what character do you ban that forces, like, this person has two characters, um, like, how do you ban them out? And you can't do. So what I want them to do next season is double down and make it so each team is two bans. <sighs> Wow, that is a strong statement, so, and, and that is very, very interesting, actually. How would you execute that? Go ahead, continue. What? Uh, it's not necessarily... Uh, so, obviously, teams would take turns with their bands, but what I'm really interested in is you tell... you. The important thing is that everyone buys in. If not everyone buys in, like IDOM or like Toy, where they don't have a strong secondary to bring out, then it isn't. it doesn't really work. But if everyone buys in and everyone is playing, everyone has other characters to play, then it becomes a really, really, really interesting uh, kind of strategy. And because the more bands you have, the more strategy and the more matchup stuff you kind of have to think about. And so I think that would be, it would be really interesting to see. And we'd also get to see people, more people play other characters. We wouldn't have, uh, and it would also be, I think, really interesting to see just other people and see where their attention, their character choices go to. So, yeah. Uh, Geki, go ahead. Uh, just to point, to further add on to that point, I think instead of having two bands, although I don't, not that I don't like that idea, I think that's interesting, um, I would prefer to see uh, not being able to ban the same character in a row. So, mm -hmm. for example, fair. you know, having, so then you would see the Bison, you would see the Laura, not out of choice, but out of being forced, because the last team already banned them one time, so now you can't ban that again. So I think that would make it even more interesting as well. But then we wouldn't be able to see the best birdie in A. It's true. He could always pick it, though, right? No yeah, one's going to ban that. At this he's point, he's got so much practice. practice. He's got so much practice at this point that he's going to become the best birdie in A. <laughs> no, that, that is actually a really interesting point moving forward. We are just about at the halfway point of the season. We got one more week coming up this Thursday before every team has played each other once. And currently in our uh, pre-draft pick em, we've had Geki jump off the fence. We've had Spliced Helix still be right. And Morty and I are wondering what the heck Do is thinking picking G.
that'll do it for us this week here on Beyond the Fist. If you guys have any questions for myself or the panel, you guys can see our Twitter handles on there. Use the hashtag Beyond the Fist. Tweet at us, and we will respond to you as best we can. All video footage from today's live cast is used with permission from Capcom. Follow the Street Fighter League and the Capcom Pro Tour on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Capcom Fighters, on YouTube at youtube.com slash Capcom Fighters, and on Facebook Live, facebook.com slash Capcom Fighters. Week 6, match day 5 of Street Fighter League airs Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. As mentioned before, this is the midway point of the season. Looking forward to see how the strategy changes going into the second half. Our live cast discussion of Week 6 Match Day 5 will be Monday, May 20th, same time, 9 p.m. Thank you to Mortzi, Geki, and Spliced Helix, my panel, for this evening. This has been Tagashi Azrael and Toga TV. Thanks for watching Beyond the Fist. We will see you guys next week.